All right, well, um, good evening. My name is Paula Hannaway Crown. I'm a Trinity graduate of 1980 and a member of your board of trustees. We're pleased to have with us tonight this year's Crown lecturer, Howard Gardner. Dr. Gardner is a foremost intellectual researcher and author in education. His theory of multiple intelligences provides deeper understanding of the ways in which we as humans can achieve our highest potential. Dr. Gardner is the 11th crown lecturer in an extraordinary list of distinguished speakers. They've talked to, talked to our Duke community about the important ethical issues and their implications in our society today. This lecture series is named after my father-in-law, Lester Crown, who unfortunately could not be here this evening. He uh, sends his regards. My father-in-law is a man who continues to lead a most compelling ethical life by example. My mother-in-law, Renee Crown, however, is here. Um, and um, we're, we're so glad that you were able to come. She's a mother of seven, grandmother of 25, and she and dad recently celebrated their 60th wedding anniversary. And you know what they say, next to every great man is a great woman, or a surprise mother-in-law, I can't remember. Um, but this certainly is the case with my mother-in-law, and thank you so much for being here. We're also fortunate to have other family members, Nancy and Steve Crown, and my nephew, Connor Crown, class of 2013, go Devils. Um, and my husband, I guess I should call you my great husband. Um, the um, Crown Lecture Series has really gone beyond our expectations in terms of the breadth and complexity of material. And just to provide a quick history and some contextual highlights. Last year, Rebecca Skloot, author of The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, spoke about the ethical challenges that arise when medical capabilities advance more quickly than our moral and legal thinking. In 2008, eminent physician, scientist, academic, Julian Savalescu discussed the moral imperatives to enhance human beings with science and medical technology. In 2007, Paul Rusesa Begina, the hotel manager who was featured in the movie Hotel Rwanda, talked about the horrendous years during the genocide in his country. Jared Diamond, the Pulitzer Prize winning author of Guns, Germs, and Steel, and eminent scientist environmentalist, discussed adaptation strategies for individuals and societies in response to crisis. Nobel Peace Prize winner Jody Williams informed us how she used the internet to advocate for what ultimately became the treaty to ban landmines. Former FCC Chair Newt Minow, who coined the phrase vast wasteland to describe television, discussed the implications of media violence on children and issues of free speech. An author and New York Times correspondent Tom Friedman all alerted us to the opportunities and responsibilities in a developing globalized world. My personal takeaway from these lectures has been that ethics is about the heart and the intellect. Knowledge must be pursued with scientific rigor, discipline, and creative thinking. And only then can we make wise choices in our lives. Also would like to thank Joel Fleischman for uh, being the inspiration for this series. And um, thank you all for attending. Uh, and Howard, we so look forward to hearing you. Just before we begin, a, a few housekeeping uh, notes. Uh, if you haven't turned off your cell phones, please do. And uh, at the end of the talk, there are microphones upstairs where Joel is and downstairs. And uh, we'll uh, take questions seriatim, going back and forth, uh, asking only that you keep your questions uh, relatively brief. Uh, and now, on behalf of the Sanford School, I'd like to welcome all of you to the Crown uh, Lecture on Ethics for 2011. And I'd like to welcome special guests, uh, President Broadhead and Cindy Broadhead, and of course, the Crown family, the entire family. 
and uh, members of the Duke Board of Trustees who are here as well. The Crown Lecture in Ethics brings speakers to campus to discuss compelling ethical issues in the fields of art, science, medicine, business, and social policy. The lecture series itself is made possible by a gift from Lester Crown and the Crown family, who are longtime friends and supporters of Duke and who have served the university in many capacities. And Paula, from whom you just heard, is a 1980 Duke graduate who currently serves on the Board of Trustees. We're grateful for their support and vision in choosing ethics as a focus for the annual talk to the Duke community that this is. Why are we so interested in ethics at Duke? Terry Sanford founded this school with a deliberate emphasis on ethics, a conviction that rigorous analysis needs to be coupled with an abiding awareness of the fact that the policy choice that one has to make in public policy inevitably involves value conflict and that our students need to understand and be thoughtful about trade-offs involved in such conflicts. A course in ethics remains a required part of our core curriculum, which itself is imbued with a concern for ethical issues. Our Heart Leadership Program has courses that address such issues as the meaning of moral courage and the ways and situations in which moral courage is important to effective leadership. The Keenan Institute for Ethics teaches courses that examine what communities we belong to, what values we ought to uphold, how we should exercise our political and civic rights, and to whom we are responsible and why. And in recent years, as Duke University has reinvigorated its commitment to putting knowledge in the service of society, Duke students through the Duke Engage program have sought to be more engaged in the world addressing critical human needs through immersive service that provides meaningful assistance to communities throughout the world and in, in the process of contributing to making the world a better place transforms their lives as well. For that reason, we're pleased to have the opportunity to hear from Howard Gardner, tonight's Crown Lecture on a topic about which we are actively seeking deeper understanding. Howard Gardner is the John H. and Elizabeth a. Hobbs, Professor of Cognition and Education at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. He grew up in Scranton, Pennsylvania, where as a child he was curious about everything, studious, and until adolescence, serious about playing the piano. The first in his family to attend college, he earned a bachelor's degree in social relations at Harvard. As a Harvard Fellow at the London School of Economics, he spent a postgraduate year reading philosophy and sociology and then returned to Harvard where he earned his PhD in development psychology in 1971. Among numerous honors, Gardner has received the MacArthur Genius Prize Fellowship, 26 honorary degrees from universities all over the world. In 2005 and again in 2008, Foreign Policy and Prospect magazines named him among the world's 100 most influential public intellectuals. And the Wall Street Journal has named him one of the top five influential business thinkers, a group that includes journalists Tom Friedman and Malcolm Gladwell, as well as philanthropist and former Microsoft CEO Bill Gates. He has written 25 books, which have been translated into 28 languages, as well as several hundred articles. Many of you know him from his theory of multiple intelligences, which Paula mentioned. First advanced 28 years ago, that countered the idea of a single human intelligence that could be measured with a tool such as a standardized IQ test. This revolutionary idea has had a profound effect on the way we think about human capabilities. It created a sea change in methods we use to measure human capacity to think, learn, and create, and has influenced, at least to some degree, what happens in many classrooms, including mine. Ronald Reagan's biographer, Lou Cannon, portions of whose book, The Role of a Lifetime, I've Assigned My Students, has written that, Gardner's analysis of the way Reagan functioned intellectually produced in me a sense of discovery that a scientist or dis detective feels when a gigantic mystery abruptly becomes comprehensible. Many of you may not be aware, however, of the full range of Howard Gardner's work. He once summarized his 40-year career this way. I am a research psychologist who has been investigating cognitive development in normal and gifted children cognitive breakdown after brain damage, the nature of intelligence, creativity, and leadership, and the fate of professional ethics in a market-drenched society. Since the mid-1990s, he has directed the Good Work Project, 
a comprehensive study at wor of work that is excellent, engaging, and ethical. He is also investigating the nature of trust in contemporary society and ethical dimensions that go along with the use of the new digital media. His most recent book was an edited volume titled Good Work, Theory and Practice. That work is related to the topic he will address today. His talk is entitled, Good Persons, Good Workers, Good Citizens, What Are They? How Can We Promote Them? Please join me in welcoming the Crown Lecturer for 2011, Howard Gardner. Is this better? <laughs> That's a rhetorical question. Uh, anyway, I'm very glad to be here. This is an incredible space, and I even see some people lurking whom I think I know way up there. Um, and I've been made to feel very much at home here today. Uh, I don't usually carry a cane, um, but um, I've been having some leg pains, and I may have to shift to a chair at a certain point, but people have been very gracious and hospitable. My computer also crashed this morning, and believe it or not, the good people here at the school were able to fix it, so we have a lecture, uh, and I'll have another lecture uh, elsewhere uh, later, later during the week. Um, and special pleasure to see so many members of the Crown family here. We had a chance to do a little uh, discussion beforehand, and uh, I actually feel like we could just go into questions after the introduction, but I suppose <laughs> uh, I have to sing for my supper. So you know what, what I'm going to be talking about today. Can you all see the, uh, the, 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 the slides? Good. Well, let's, uh, let's get going then. So um, you can tell from the title that I'm interested in the word good. And we could probably all define it. Uh, but the work that I'm doing is playing on different connotations of the word good. And one of the things I hope to uh, catalyze today is more thinking about what, what it means when we, when we call somebody good or when we call something that they do good. And um, since we are at a eminent university, I thought I would take an example from college admissions. This is a made up example, but everybody in this room will recognize it. Here are two um, students who, by argument, are in high school and they're applying to college. Uh, student number one, we'll call him, and student number two, um, and they each want to go to a good school like Duke. So now imagine that you had to occupy one of three roles with reference to this uh, college, it's called, called call the student a junior. You're a next door neighbor, and the student asks you to write a letter of recommendation. Now, you really don't know that much about the student, um, but you know the family, and you like them, and you certainly feel that you don't want to do anything to let the student down. You don't want to say no. So you, you, you write the best letter that you can. That's one kind of role. And as you get older, you'll all be asked to do that, and you'll all wonder what to say, um, and you, you'll have to come to a conclusion. The second uh, is you are a college admission officer. And at a place like Duke or Harvard, many, many people want to go there. There are not very many places. There are many competing demands, uh, many competing kinds of students. How do you make the decision whether to admit one student as opposed to the other, including the two that I just uh, introduced? The third is that you're a voter in some kind of polity, and there is a binding referendum on the ballot about whether at the state university there should be affirmative action. You all know what affirmative action is, uh, you know, admitting students um, on the basis of something other than their pure academic record because of an interest in having diversity on the campus. Um, in any kind of a complex society, uh, we're called on to fulfill these three roles, and as you probably already anticipate, 
they map onto the three roles of the title, person, worker, and citizen. There's one uh, distinction which I'm going to introduce today, um, which is not well known because I just made it up, um, but uh, I think it is important for understanding the realm of good when we think of these three different roles. And the distinction which I'm just going to label now and explicate later is the distinction between neighborly morality, and you can already anticipate that has to do with the next door neighbor who writes that letter of recommendation, and the roles of worker, such as the professional who works in the admissions office, and the role of citizen, the person who's asked to um, give his or her vote, either for or against uh, a referendum of consequence. So who's good and not good and why? I'm going to show you a bunch of um, faces. I'll give you a second to see if you can recognize them. Um, actually, his name is there, so it's probably not too hard to <laughs> recognize Nelson Mandela. I'm not going to take a vote, but I think I can guess what most people would say. He's a good guy. Now, I used to say my kids think that this is Ben Kingsley, but it's actually, <laughs> and that joke is probably, had by, uh, it's, it's superannuated by now, but uh, uh, Gandhi is actually interested. I've spent more time studying Gandhi than anybody else, and uh, there are a lot of things one can say quite critical of Gandhi, but probably uh, on many dimensions he, he does very well. This is Sully. You remember him, the uh, uh, Captain Sullenberger who uh, landed the plane safely a couple years ago. Um, this is Wesley Austin, I believe his name was, the, uh, the worker in New York who um, saw somebody uh, in the subway, third rail, and jumped down and saved the person's life. Anybody know who this is? This is the um, whistleblower at Enron, Sharon Watkins. Uh, you know, first went private, then went public with the cooking of the books at uh, Enron a dozen years ago. You all know Bernie Madoff. Uh, now, of course, uh, three years ago, if we put this picture up, uh, probably we would have gotten pretty good scores, right? Uh, so it ain't over till the, uh, the fat lady sings, or in this case, uh, uh, Kenneth Feinberg, whoever, or Picard, whoever the... Uh, 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 so here, this, this is interesting. You know who this is? Yes, this is Assange. Uh, uh, how about this guy? You had... Uh, um, Doris Kearns was a lecturer here, right? She, she, she knew Lyndon Johnson very well. Uh, those of us who lived in Lyndon Johnson's era could talk for a long time about the extent to which he was or wasn't a good person, good worker, good citizen. So they're not all as clear as Mandela or Bernie Madoff. And for all we know, Bernie Madoff was a perfectly good neighbor, though he did not make it very good for his uh, surviving family members. So this is a way, if, if we had a class, we would talk about uh, how to map the concept of good onto these individuals and the various roles that they, that they assume. The work, um, as was mentioned, grows out of a, a project which I've been working on for over 15 years. Um, and let me actually go back there. Um, yes, um, unfortunately, the way this thing is, was designed, you can't read the authors, but I'm just one of the authors of this work on, book on good work by uh, uh, Bill Damon, Mike Csikszentmihalyi, and, and, and myself. We're three psychologists who've been trying to understand what good work is, and more recently trying to promote it. So that's the, the theme of the talk. And um, the work began, as I say, over 15 years ago, when we were together in California at a, a Center for Advanced Study for Behavioral Sciences. It's sort of a grazing ground for aging scholars, um, and there were two um, impetuses for the, for the study. One was we had all done work which had been used, and sometimes we were very pleased by the way it was used, but sometimes we were kind of appalled. In my own case, uh, and there was a state in Australia which built, based a curriculum on multiple intelligences, and part of the material for the teachers had a list of each of the racial and ethnic groups 
in the society and which intelligences they had and which ones they lacked. Uh, I was appalled when I heard about this and I actually went on television in Australia and I said, this is pseudoscience, uh, uh, it has nothing to do with what I'm talking about. But when you get to be of a certain age and your ideas get to be known, if they're misused, the question is who's responsible for trying to correct that? And I think I would have said, you know, 20 years ago, well, my idea is to produce, my job is to produce the ideas. I have no responsibility for how they're used. But I came to realize that if I didn't take responsibility, I couldn't really expect anybody else to either. So that was a personal origin for my colleagues and me. The other one was political. Uh, Ronald Reagan was already mentioned, and I guess I do have to pin some blame on the Gipper. Uh, but this was a time when people were saying, uh, Government is bad, uh, uh, markets are good, and every sphere of society is better off if it's simply uh, governed by market forces. Uh, I have nothing against markets. I've been a, a beneficiary of markets, as have many people here. But the notion that everything from education to health care to legal protection should only be based on how much people could afford seemed to us to be taking a step too far. And so it was that. Uh, already familiar litany in the middle 90s, which was another impetus for the Good Work Project. So we're grandiose, as aging grazers are, uh, and we ask big questions like this. What's a good work? What's a good life? And as educators, and everybody here is involved in some way in education, what's our responsibility for trying to promote um, good work and good citizenship? Um, the, it took us about five years to um, figure out exactly what we're doing and Joel Fleischman is up there somewhere and uh, he was good enough to support this work before we actually knew what it is what we were doing and I think accountability is great but only uh, if you give people time to formulate what it is that they're interested in and so the question that we finally realized we were asking is how do people want to do good work succeed or fail at a time like then, and I would say a time like this, when things are changing very, very quickly, our whole sense of time and space is being altered by the new digital media. Market forces are powerful and, this is important, there aren't countervailing forces. Markets have always been important and powerful going back to prehistoric times, but they've been religious or communitarian or ideological isms of the 20th century which have contoured and regulated markets in certain ways, but at least in the society where we knew that was waning. And uh, we assumed it would not be easy to do good work under conditions like this. So, we are social scientists. What we did was, over a 10-year period, we interviewed over 1,200 professionals in nine different professions. We used what are called semi-structured interviews. We had 61 questions, um, but we didn't go from number 42 to number 43 if it had already been answered. We um, made sure we covered all the important questions. We um, read a lot about these people. Many of them were well-known, some of them um, household names. Maybe somebody in this room was interviewed. I don't remember, and if I did, I wouldn't say it. We also did some more systematic inventory of their values we posed ethical dilemmas to them, and we got a lot of information about these people who are informants about good work. That's important because we never knew for sure whether somebody whom we interviewed was a good worker. Um, we're not investigative journalists, but we assumed, rightly or wrongly, that people who've been nominated because of their reflectiveness in these professions could help us understand what good workers, even if they didn't exemplify it themselves. That at least was a, a working assumption of the study. Um, I actually didn't know who this is, but my, everybody else does. Uh, he's the guy on Law and Order. Um, he's a lawyer. Um, Sam Waterston, is that his name? Um, anyway, the, most of the people we, we studied were professionals. Not all, but most of them were in medicine or law or education, science and so on. And so that would be a prototypical person if he were genuinely a lawyer whom we would, would have interviewed. Um, what distinguishes journalists from social scientists is this word coding. 
um, instead of simply talking to people and maybe tape recording it and reading the transcripts, we um, pour over what it is that they said and we categorize it in various ways. And uh, this is some of the things we look for. You know, did they have mentors of what sort? Did they have what we call anti-mentors? The one person I don't want to be like is Howard Gardner. That's an anti-mentor. Um, what changes they saw in their work, what they were trying to achieve, and so on. And this is a bit hyperbolic because we didn't spend two weeks on every subject. But in the beginning of our study, it would often be at least a week and sometimes more of doing background reading, doing the interviews, transcribing them. They often were 40 or 50 single space pages, and then coding them so that the conclusions that we came to had some sort of scientific warrant. And I don't know whether this is something, well, I'm simply going to say it. I'm not going to characterize it. The Good Work Project has been very productive. We have published 10 books and hundreds of articles. So there's been a lot of social science inflicted on uh, uh, the, the, the academy. Um, but my focus today is less on the findings, which are readily available, but more on what I think they mean and how I think we can use them um, in work and in citizenship. So I'm only going to talk about two findings. One is what good work is. You've been wondering what it is. And number two, what helps good work be achieved? Here are the three E's of good work. Good work is excellent, it's engaging, and it's carried out in an ethical way. Excellent means it's technically good. People know what they're doing. They've mastered the requisite skills. Engaging means people care. They want to do it. In Chicxet Mahai's phrase, they get flow out of it. It's an important part of their life. They look forward to Monday morning. They don't dread it. Third of all, and this is what we're focusing on today, it's ethical. It's carried out in a responsible way. We focus primarily on professions because professions have codes which indicate what it is to be an ethical lawyer as opposed to an unethical lawyer, an ethical doctor as opposed to an unethical doctor, and so on. But um, ethics is, of course, not restricted just to things for which you have to get a lot of degrees. Nonetheless, it's easier to decide what it means to be an ethical journalist than it is to say being an ethical business person or an ethical artist. Because if you're an artist or a business person, your only obligations are to obey the law. It's great if you're ethical, but that's not, you can't lose your license if, if you're not. So those are the three E's. We call this ENA, patterned after DNA. And if you think about it, and here's where the power begins to come in, you can be very excellent, but not particularly engaged or ethical. You can be extremely ethical, but not know what you're doing. Uh, and you can be very much engaged and give everybody a very hard time. So it's possible to have one or two of these strands, but the good worker somehow manages to intertwine the three strands, the three E's. And we have many discussions about whether empathy or equity, whether there should be other E's, but uh, so far for me, these are the three fundamental components of good work. What is alignment? Alignment is a state of affairs in any work environment where basically everybody wants the same thing. And it is much easier to do good work if there is a common mission that everybody agrees upon. So educational institutions are very interesting examples. I look at the president in this regard. You've got students, alums, trustees, faculty, staff. If you're a government, uh, you get grants from the government. You've got government. You've got the general public. You've got Richard Aaron who writes a book saying that uh, uh, colleges aren't teaching people anything. Uh, that makes it hard because not all these groups are looking at everything in um, the same way. and They don't all want the same thing. The dramatic example for alignment came from the first two professions we looked at. We looked at journalism and genetics. Genetics in the late 20th century was a very well-aligned field. Everybody wanted to live longer and be healthier, and they said to the geneticists in America, go for it. And we asked geneticists what obstacles 
there were to their work. They said only if I have enough energy. Those were the only obstacles. Um, and uh, nobody who we talked to in genetics left the field. Even 10 or 15 years ago, journalism was massively misaligned. The reporters wanted one thing, the editors wanted a second thing, the publishers wanted a third thing, uh, the readers wanted a fourth thing, the stockholders wanted a fifth thing, and it was very, very difficult to do good work in alignment. Full stop, because it, it wasn't aligned. When a, an area is well aligned, it's easier to do good work, but it doesn't mean good work will, will um, be produced. You can be a freeloader uh, and take advantage of the fact that the field is well aligned and do what you want and get away with it. By the same token, you can be in a massively misaligned field and still do good work. It's just harder. And some people, I'll throw out two names most known to most of you, Ralph Nader and Noam Chomsky, are very energized by misalignment. They'd be very unhappy if everybody were on the same page. But for most of us who just want to get on with our own work, alignment uh, is a very desirable state of affairs. So those are two of the many findings which grow out of the project. It's only in the last few years when I began to work with many other people in the area of citizenship that I came to realize that the three E's can be applied equally appropriately to um, citizenship. Good citizens know the laws, the rules, the regulations. Maybe they don't have to read the Constitution from the beginning to end at the beginning of every session, but they kind of know the ropes. Number two, they care. It's not enough to kind of know what it is to be a citizen. You have to be, it has to be important to you. And third, and here um, where there could be disagreement, I think the, um, the good citizen is not only promoting his or her own interests, the good citizen is thinking about the larger polity, what's good for everybody or for others, not just for yourself. So we would make the argument, or at least I would make the argument, that just as good workers have to have all three of these um, intertwined, so too good citizens. And there's now a growing awareness in this country, really just in the last few years, um, that there's something very inadequate about our preparation for citizenship among the population. Um, and at least some people are worried enough about it that uh, they'd want to do something about it. So um, I already gave you some photographs before, but you might think in your own mind, whom do you consider to be a good worker or a good citizen? And as we've often found out when we find that students have nobody to mention, what's the implications of that? If there's nobody whom you admire because they're excellent, ethical, and engaged. And then a nice term of art from my own field, and that's the term of paragon. There may be nobody whom you know personally who you think is a good worker or a good citizen. Part of our pathographic society is we're very quick at showing what's wrong with people. And so it's harder to pass a good work test when all of your flaws are made publicly. But there are paragons, people from history or even from literature or from art whom one can admire even if it isn't someone whom you know personally. Indeed, the lives of saints would be a classical example of paragons. We don't know, you know Saint Anselm or uh, Saint Beatrice, but uh, we can read about them and we can try to emulate them if uh, we don't have role models of our own. So now I want to come back to that distinction, which I said is, the, I think, the one I'm going to inflict on you today. Um, I am going to argue that there's a radical difference between neighborly morality and the ethics of roles. Neighborly morality is how do you behave to the person next door. And I will argue that evolution is a big help there because we've evolved, at least historically, if not biologically, to be aware that if we injure a neighbor, that's likely to happen to us. That's what the Ten Commandments is about. Thou shalt not thy neighbors, blah, blah, blah. And it's what the golden rule is about. And probably Hammurabi's code, but I, have, I haven't read it recently. They're about how you deal with people in the neighborhood or people in your tribe, so to speak. We've had a lot of preparation over the course of history to deal with this. Worker 
in the sense of professional, and citizen, in the sense of citizen of a nation or of the world, are new concepts. We haven't had a lot of preparation, either biologically or historically, for the role of being a journalist, or a lawyer, or an engineer, or a physician. Nor have we had a lot of preparation for being a member of a, uh, of a polity, being a citizen of a city, a state, a nation, a region, the world. And so, to put it into a sentence, this is something we have to learn how to do. And not only is it difficult, but the chances of regression of going from citizen or professional to neighbor or just to selfishness are very, very high. I hope that this has a certain degree of clarity, but I invite you afterwards to probe it further. These are some of the factors which I, as an amateur uh, student of life, assume have pushed us from being simply members of tribes to citizens of different communities. Groups of people are much larger, and many people who we are around are not related to us. They don't look to us. Um, division of labor, people don't all do the same anymore. We're not all farmers. We're not all hunter-gatherers. Um, government is increasingly participatory. Read the Middle East this month, etc. cetera. Um, and so what this slide says is there are a whole lot of factors which add up to neighborly morality not being enough to carry us through the day, but having to learn to occupy the roles of professional worker or the roles of citizen. You all see that? My wife says, never read a slide if people can read it themselves. So I wanted to show uh, Tahrir Square. And this is the famous photograph from 1989 um, of the solitary Chinese man in Tiananmen Square who confronted the armed tanks. Um, in the United States and other European or European influenced countries, the notion of citizen is already pretty intuitive, even if um, we don't act as responsible citizens. But in many parts of the world, it's not. Um, I mean, you've been reading about Libya, and Libya, if, if the central government collapses, will become tribal again, because the notion of being a citizen of Libya doesn't make a lot of intuitive sense. Uh, in this country, we argue about what it means to be a good American citizen, but people don't say citizen is an incoherent um, category. So, um, Returning to those opening examples, what I would argue is, in a sense, we wear different hats in these roles. When we're the neighbor, we wear the hat of, well, um, we've known this kid, we like him, I've got a kid myself who's gonna apply to college soon, um, and uh, you know, the, the, the negative aspect is, you scratch my back, I'll scratch your, the more positive is you live with people and you try to uh, make the life as comfortable as possible. Um, that's not enough for these roles which have ethical imperatives. The college admissions officer should not be bribable. He or she should be following a set of canons about uh, the criteria for admission. And of course, there are always fuzzy areas, but you know, by, by and large, uh, there's a consensus of what it means to be a responsible admissions officer and an irresponsible one. Similarly, um, one can choose only to vote every issue in terms of one's own, one's own self-interest, but uh, I would call that irresponsibility. One ought to be thinking about the broader community, not just, not just yourself. So, this last part of the talk has to do with what happens when some social scientists decide it's not enough to study things, we should try to nudge them in the right direction. Um, and the, crystal, the crystallizing experience was actually uh, a study that we did close to 10 years ago, and we published in a book called Making Good, How Young People Cope with Moral Dilemmas 
at work. And uh, my colleagues and I studied over 100 young people who were beginning to work in three different spheres. They were, in fact, uh, journalism, theater, and science, biology. And we carried out intensive interviews with them, did the same kinds of ethical dilemmas and value sorts that um, we did with our older subjects. And the result was quite alarming to us, and we called it compromised work. Um, compromised work is not bad work. It's not work that's illegal, but it's work that doesn't get the three accolades of being good. Because what we heard over and over again from young people, and now there are many, many other studies which um, report the same thing, is young people know what good work is. They know the difference between somebody who's a good worker and somebody who's doing compromised work. Many of them aspire to it and achieve it, and that's quite wonderful. But what we heard over and over again were young people telling us, one day we're going to be good workers, and we're going to set a good work model, and we're going to hire good workers, and we're going to, and we're going to mold them and model for them. But we don't think we can afford to be good workers now because we want to achieve, we want to have our day in the sun, and we don't think the people around us are going to be fair competitors. They're going to cut corners. They're going to do what it takes to be numero uno. And so um, we want to have, be, cut some slack now while we're trying to make it, so to speak. Um, and then later, uh, later on in life, we'll, we'll atone for it. Um, some of you will remember the famous phrase from Augustine in his confessions. He said, O oh Lord, make me chaste, but not quite yet. And this was a version of the Augustinian uh, credo, make us good, but not quite yet. Let me emphasize that if young people are saying this, they're not the ones who are at fault. It's the role models they've seen, the examples the older generation has set. Number two, we don't know whether the older generation would have given the same answers 30 or 40 years ago. But what we did feel was it's not a good situation when people think good work can be postponed because it's basically a slippery slope kind of argument. Once you start compromising, it becomes all too easy to keep compromising and more and more difficult to atone later on. Um, this is just a, a throwaway slide. Um, it's not easy to be a good person, a good worker, and a good citizen. Um, nonetheless, and I guess the previous slide emphasizes that point, we are citizens of many different entities. And to be uh, a good citizen, all of them, is quite difficult, just as it's quite difficult to be a good neighbor and a good worker and a good citizen. So we don't at all minimize the challenge. Nonetheless, uh, our group is working as we can to try to uh, increase the likelihood. So what have we done? Basically, we've tried to give away good work. Uh, and that is we've tried in as many settings that want to work with us and have some interest in discussing good work, giving examples of it, having people talk about it, um, and then having reflect on what they and other people actually do in ethically challenging situations. Um, let me give just one example, because this is hopelessly uh, abstract otherwise. I'll give you the example of Debbie. Debbie is a high school junior at uh, a prestigious, and these stories that we use are all true, otherwise it would be much less powerful. And she's the editor of her high school newspaper at a good independent school. And there's a rape on campus. Um, and as a good reporter, of course, she wants to report the rape. She's called in by the head of school, and the head says, Debbie, you can't print this, because next week we're doing recruiting, and if they read in the newspaper that there's a rape on campus, um, you know, then we won't, we won't have students here next year, so I forbid you to print it. Debbie happens to be the granddaughter of a famous reporter for the New York Times. So she really has absorbed the, uh, the, the ethic of getting the story and getting it right and not being pressured to, to subdue things. So she's, you know, she's determined to write the story. 
She then goes home and she describes the situation to her mother, who is the daughter of the New York, New York Times reporter. And her mother gives her a hug and says, oh, it's wonderful that you're thinking about this and grandpa would be so proud of you. But you know, your brother Teddy wants to apply to the school next year. Uh, and uh, if you do this, you know, the chances that he's gonna have the education that you had are much slimmer, so maybe you should think a lot about whether you really wanna do this. Uh, every student we've had this with is interested in it, and so are the teachers, to our surprise. They find it equally interesting, but the point is to give people ethical dilemmas, to wrestle with them, and then to talk about the implications for their own, own lives. I'm under no illusion that a single course, and these are schools, things that we've done at different high schools and different colleges in themselves can make somebody ethical or moral um, if they're not. But in the most successful cases we've, absor we've observed, um, good work ideas become something that a school or a campus embraces. And to the extent that these ideas begin to move more broadly than a single course or a single unit in a course, then I think there's some chance that, um, that, 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 that people will really be affected. And at the very end of the talk, I'll give you the most recent idea we've had in this sphere. Um, yeah, and uh, this is a website we've created. Um, we have a website called Good Work Project, which is a typical academic website where we just tell you what we think and that's it. And the Good Work Toolkit website, um, it's participatory. You actually can't see it in the slide, but there's a Facebook, there's a Twitter capability, um, there's blogging, and uh, it's an effort to involve more and more people in the discussions of, of good work, good citizenship, and so on. Um, in addition to having um, courses and uh, units of the sort that I described and that the Debbie example epitomizes, and we have something called the toolkit, which is a very rich set of materials which people can get from us. Some of the materials are posted and they can use them in various ways. Um, we've been extremely impressed in our interviews with how important mentors and enablers are. Um, and one of the very dispiriting things in our original interviews is the decline all over the society in mentoring. 30, 40, 50 years ago, people were not as busy. They were more likely to stay in the same place, the same place of work. And many people felt a responsibility for the younger people who were going into the profession of law or medicine or architecture, or whatever. But over and over, we heard again, both from young people and older people, that the capacity for mentoring has been radically reduced because everybody's much more mobile, everybody's much busier. Um, I actually think, though I haven't at all looked at this systematically, that probably gradual, graduate work in the sciences is the most mentored area in our society now. Um, I won't say it's the only one, but it's probably the one where it's, it's still taken the most seriously. And certainly those of us who are in education need to think very, very hard about the mentoring we can do because we cannot count on extra university entities to, to fill the void. So I told the uh, um, Crown family who actually know Barack Obama uh, that I have an elevator speech for him. You know, an elevator speech is if you get caught in an elevator with somebody and you have only 90 seconds, what would you say? I've never met Barack Obama. I uh, don't know that I ever will. Um, but based on the Good Work Project, I do have a uh, elevator speech for him. Mr. President, um, our country is too much dominated by the three M's of money, markets, and me. And we need to flip those three M's to the three E's of excellence, engagement, and ethics. And then I'm about to twist <laughs> my one remaining limb <laughs> to the W of we. Uh, because this isn't something that other people have to do, it's something we have to do with, with people. Um, and uh, I'm sure, by the way, Barack Obama doesn't need me to say this, um, but I do think that 
we do need a, this is it. I've actually, uh, this is the first time I've ever said this. When I said we don't, that there's no counter story to the market story, the good story is the counter story. It doesn't deny markets. It doesn't deny money. It doesn't deny me. But it says that we don't have workers and citizens who are not only excellent and engaged, but also ethical and responsible. We're not going to have a viable society. So maybe that'll be the new, the new, the new speech for the president. OK, I'm coming to a conclusion. If you're wondering whether you're a good worker, here's the four questions to ask. Um, uh, what are the goals and values of your profession? Or if you're a student, um, like Connor, your, your aspiring profession, uh, and of, of whatever role you want to play in that profession, who are the people you look, look up to and why? And then, are, can you learn from people who you don't look up to, what we call anti-mentors or tormentors? Um, and more and more now, uh, and this was to some extent true in my day, but it's more true now, many of us have to, be, have to do fragmentering. We have to take aspects of different people because we don't have enough time or we find the flaws of the single role model. Then the mirror test for yourself is if you look at yourself in the mirror, not squinting but clear-eyed, do you really pass the three E's? Uh, and if not, what can you do about it? And then, even if you think you do pretty well, at a certain point you become what I call a trustee with a little t, you worry about the domain as a whole, the profession as a whole. So even if you're doing good journalism or good architecture or good teaching, if the rest of the profession is falling down on the job, what can you do to, to help? And the questions about citizenship are quite parallel. What does it mean to be a citizen in your society? Who do you look up to as being model citizens or not? And uh, when you look at yourself clear-eyed, um, what do you see? And how about other people if they, don't, um, if they don't measure up? I'm going to close. You, you heard mention that uh, my work is best known for studies of intelligence. And I've enjoyed doing that for many years. But I like to leave with thoughts from people who are much wiser than I am. One, Reverend Martin Luther King, Jr., who said, intelligence plus character, that's a goal of a true education. And this is Ralph Waldo Emerson, um, as portrayed in a Barnes and Noble bag, <laughs> shopping bag. Uh, and uh, uh, Emerson said, character is more important than intelligence. Uh, we have no paucity in our society of people who are smart on any definition. Um, and uh, yet, uh, they often don't end up producing a society that we're very, very proud of. Uh, David Halberstam wrote a book called The Best and the Brightest, which was a s sarcastic comment of the people who got us into the Vietnam War and couldn't get out. Um, this is really a talk about character. It's a talk about ethics. And it's a talk about things which haven't, I think, had enough attention in our society in recent years, and anything any of us can do to bring more attention to it and help to bring it about, I think, is, is praiseworthy. Um, so I mentioned the Good Work Toolkit. There's also a Good Work Project website. But I wanted to leave you with something which, is, which we just came up with um, last week, and that's the Good App. <laughs> and uh, funders have often said to me, um, well, what's your goal of your project? And for many years, I've given an answer which never satisfied them, even though it was an honest answer. I said, I want the question, is he or she, she, is he or she a good worker, asked of people, and that the answer would really matter. So the good app is now just a concept. But if every object we looked at, every institution we looked at, every person we looked at, we said, is he or she excellent, engaged, and ethical? And the answer really mattered. That's the society that I'd like to live in. Thanks very much. Um, and uh, I think we're going to turn to questions. And uh, do you want to um, Now we're only going to take good questions uh, <laughs> from the bottom and the top. Uh, 
please line up and ask them. We'll, we'll give you a few seconds to get ready. Well, if you want to give it to me here, I'll, I'll repeat it. If you sense there's no real counterforce, what does that say about the nonprofit sector? Well, um, it says that I'm hyperbolic, I guess. Uh, I, th I guess I would say two things. One is um, not, the nonprofit sector, alas, is not p much a part of the public discourse. Um, if you watch cable news, for example, whether it's left, center, or right, um, it's, not, it's not much of the narrative. So a, lot of, a lot of it is not really as vivid. The other thing, and here I'm going to step on controversial grounds, is when the nonprofit sector gets too um, inflected by market ways of thinking, it can be undermined. Um, my friend Joel and I have talked a lot about that. Um, I think accountability is important and fine, but not when things get distorted so, they are, so it's accountability uber alles. Um, but cer certainly, uh, it's a limit of what I talked today to say that there's no, no counterforce. Um, when I spoke earlier today to, to journalists here, I talked a lot about social entrepreneurship, which I think is one of the most promising developments in a country over the last uh, couple of decades. Um, but I made two points about social entrepreneurship. One is the point I just made. When it, when it becomes overpowered by market ways of thinking, it can often be undermining. Um, the other point is the point that John Gardner, who was a hero of many of us, of us not a relative of mine, made to me uh, shortly before he died. He said there's never been so many young people in America doing, he didn't use the term good work, but he could have, doing, doing work that, that's admirable. He said, but in the end it doesn't add up because um, young people are helping dozens or even hundreds, but meanwhile legislation is being passed and not passed, which is hurting tens of thousands or millions. And so what he said was uh, all of us and young people have to be able to yoke social entrepreneurship, good work, Teach for America, you name it, to the national political scene. And we haven't figured out how to do that. And as you probably know, John Gardner's cause for the last 25 years was campaign finance reform. Because if you either have to be as rich as Michael Bloomberg to run, or you have to spend all your time raising funds and then, of course, being in, in, in um, obligation to people who are funding you, the notion of having a fair-minded political system is very, very difficult. And no other country has our system. Um, Lawrence Lessig, who is a well-known lawyer in, in Boston, is um, devoting a lot of time to how to fix up our, fix up our Congress. Uh, um, and he actually came up with an interesting idea. He's going to write a book about it. Um, and he says it doesn't have any chance of being passed, but it would change everything. If every voter had $50, which they could assign to any political cause they wanted, that would add up to $6 billion, which would cover all campaigns. And if that were done, it would, with a stroke of a pen, wipe out the influence of it's called Citizens United uh, on, on politics. But uh, in this country, as I say, it can't happen. And yet there's no other country that has a political system like ours. We used to say, that's great. But now we all recognize it's broken. It's just a disagreement about how to fix it. Oh, my turn. Uh, I, uh, this is a fascinating talk. and. Uh, really engaging, uh, but of all the parts of it, the one that really leapt out at me was when you talked about compromised work. Uh, because the point of compromised work is it's not people who are bad, it's people who actually are good and who understand the concept of the good, but who don't feel regularly obliged to live up to it, right? And so, you and, and of course, then when you talk about, you're talking about young, young workers. Uh, I've spent my life as a teacher uh, working with college age and post-college age populations. And I guess my real question about this is, to what extent do you allow a developmental factor in that? Or to what extent do you see that as a judgment of a culture? I'll say where I know it. 
Uh, you know, when you think of students, you know people who sometimes achieve the very highest, but sometimes are content to achieve the next highest, uh, and sometimes achieve the highest standard of personal behavior, but sometimes don't quite take the trouble without completely deluding themselves of doing that. And sometimes you're very engaged, but sometimes you're a little disengaged. Uh, and I could describe other people that way, but when I think of myself at the age of a student, uh, it seems to me that there might, you might say there's something developmental about it. So I'm wondering whether you allow room for the fact that a part of what it means to grow is to grow into the sense of the obligation of goodness, uh, or to what extent you see that as something that you can already you know, look at people at different points of their life and uh, say, uh, you're, you're only a B plus. I think, I think that's a great question. Um, certainly, you know, the more we know about life, the more we know that uh, it's a lifelong developmental process, and uh, it's not over until, until you're over. Um, we did find with um, young people that there is a shift in the direction that you, that you describe, namely that in general, there's a more instrumental, utilitarian view of uh, their place in the workplace, in their place in, uh, the, citizen, in the citizenry um, than there is with at least some people as they get older. That's, that is a developmental uh, trend. On the other hand, uh, it's also the case that adolescents often see things more black and white than older people do. And older people often make compromises, um, you know, sort of um, holding, uh, you know, kind of, kind of Covering, covering their faces. So it's, it's not as easy as um, good work is, a, is open only to, to those of us who are, to myself, who are superannuated. Um, but um, what, I, what I've learned actually in spending a lot of time now with, with, with young people is that often they don't even um, see things in the way that somebody who uh, has been around sees them. And I then realized this is not their fault, but rather a combination of development on the one hand and the messages in society on the other. Uh, let me give an example, which has really blew my mind. Uh, in one of these groups that I was running some years ago, we talked about a case which you probably know uh, and other people have heard about. The, the Dean of Admissions at MIT um, was summarily fired after 30 years because she had systematically lied about her credentials. And to people like me, it was sort of obvious that you can't be judging other people's credentials if you had lied about them yourself, your own credentials. In a group of maybe 15 students, there was nobody who felt that she should be fired. Um, the division of opinion was roughly between, well, she's doing a good job, What's the problem? You know, she's excellent, so you should be happy. Uh, or, well, everybody lies on their resume. Um, and at this point, I intervened and I said, look, you know, lying is not a good thing, you know that, and for neighborly morality reasons, you shouldn't lie. I didn't use that term. I said, but let me tell you something pragmatically. If you lie on any CV, that is automatic grounds for being fired. So if you're not gonna lie for, uh, I mean, if, if you, you, better, you better not lie for practical reasons if, you're not, uh, if you don't recognize the, uh, the ethical or moral principle for lying. Um, but that said, uh, the, the, the point there, uh, Dick, is that we shouldn't assume that the way that one generation sees it is the other. My wife's a faculty member. The other day, one of the faculty members was saying, well, I'm completely against plagiarism, but I don't see how we can um, punish plagiarism when everybody lies, um, and we know that people who write op-eds aren't writing their own piece, they're borrowing it from somewhere else, and I'm sure you would agree that simply makes our job more important and harder, but it, we can't at all assume it's obvious what's, what, what the right thing to do is. And when I was talking earlier with, the, with Connor and the Crown family about the digital media, which I'm now deeply immersed in, it's very, very important to know how um, the connected generation sees, for example, multitasking and uh, social networks and so on. And those of us who are older 
should be very loath to make judgments before we understand the reasons for it. So anyway, thank you for that good question. I'm curious to know how faith maps into your modeling. Um, faith. faith and or kind of major religions. Okay, well actually I just gave a long interview to the magazine here that's, that's published um, about uh, faith and ethics. Uh, I, I don't know whether the journalist is here or not. Uh, she? Um, so, uh, I'll give you a brief summary, but I actually did talk about it. Um, from a personal point of view, I do not believe that good work is dependent upon or requires any kind of a religious faith, nor do I believe that it either makes it more likely or less likely. But empirically, um, many of the people whom we studied talked about the importance of early uh, religious training. And interestingly enough, um, even when they no longer were believers. So they would say, you know, I don't go to church anymore, or, you know, I'm agnostic now, but um, I really value what I learned as a child, the stories and the Sunday school I went to and so on. So um, religion, in terms of organized religion, often appears in the testimony of people, whether or not they um, are personally practicing now. I mentioned to the journalist that, um, if we had carried out the study more in the South, I think it would have come up much more frequently than it did on the coasts, which is where the study was basically carried out. Um, in, actually in Boston, San Francisco, and Chicago, which is actually one of the coasts. People, the Crown family doesn't know that. <laughs> um, it doesn't come up a lot, and I think that's more uh, the way people talk. Um, but faith is not the same as religion. Um, I think that you would not want to be a good worker and a good citizen unless you had a sense of a larger whole into which you felt you should play a part. Um, and that part would be to do, you know, the Boy Scout manual says, to move things in the right direction. Um, and I think that that's a, a faith which can come from religion, but it can also come from reflection on life in the way that anybody who's of an introspective or philosophical um, frame of mind will. Here the whole Chicago School of, of Economics and Law is very interesting because it relies very much on the Adam Smith economic model that society is best if everybody is just out for themselves doing their own thing. But as you probably know, there was a whole other part of Adam Smith's work on moral sentiments which presupposed that people saw themselves as citizens, as members of the community and would do things which were, went beyond themselves. And so even in the, in, in the heart of Milton Friedman land, uh, if you look at the, you know, the, the, or the, you know, the person who came up with those ideas, it, it, it is part of what I would happy to call faith or at least a, a broader kind of view, but it's not religion in any uh, uh, you know, organization, organized sense. I hope that uh, was responsive. Yes, thank you for taking my question. Um, in your introduction, we heard that there are courses required on ethics and ethical inquiry as part of Duke's undergraduate curriculum. Um, and in your research, you focused on strong professions that adhere to a code of conduct, a code of professional conduct, and uh, engineers, medicine, variety of professions. I coordinate training here in responsible conduct of research, research ethics for our graduate students. And um, so that's to try to ensure they're aware of what misconduct is and how to avoid that. We talk about preventive ethics sometimes with them uh, in terms of uh, your research. I guess one thing I'm, we're trying to start to focus here at Duke and with other universities is what are the educational strategies or approaches toward um, good conduct, good research, avoiding misconduct. And so I just wonder if there, maybe in your toolkit there are some things I can locate, but are there educational strategies or pedagogical methods that you think might be connected toward uh, promotion of good persons, good workers, good citizens? Uh, yeah, I, I'm going to give a, a short and very personal answer to that. Um, one of the things that I probably started to do before I was conscious of it, 
but uh, have been doing uh, almost to the extent of uh, excess is both within family and at work, and I work with a wonderful team of about a dozen researchers, is to be extremely reflective about all the decisions we make, and particularly ones which have any kind of an ethical dimension to it. And what is the greatest satisfaction to me is when the people who work with me, whether it's my kids and family uh, or my researchers, are actually discern things I don't discern um, and bring things to my attention. And yesterday was a wonderful experience. I have an assistant who was hired two years ago just to um, uh, do my scut work. That's not quite fair, but... Uh, um, and yet, uh, I draw her in as I would anybody else, and I was involved in a very complicated ethical thing, and I said, I want to talk with you about it. And I drafted a letter, and she said, let me work on it. And I said, my job's done. Um, and uh, we talked a lot among the Crown family about the reason for person-to-person -person education as opposed to doing it all online or doing it all from books. And uh, the notion of ethics online really seems pretty oxymoronic to me. Um, and what I do believe, um, and this came out a lot from the Good Work interviews, is other than the stuff we were talking about earlier, your family and values, which are clearly um, very, very important. Um, and I guess I, re I realize now that uh, in the audience is the daughter of the rabbi for the Sunday school I went to, uh, the temple I went to, so uh, there's a little personal thing there. Um, the institutional culture of your first real job, incredibly important. I'm not talking about a summer internship where you then go back to uh, high school or college, but the first real job if that's a place where good work is in the DNA and you want to stay there, that's an enormous difference than if it's a place where compromised work or bad work. I mean, given where I come from, you would be surprised if I use this, the examples, the difference between working for NPR and the working for Fox. But you can, you can fill in your own examples. It makes an, an enormous difference. Um, and a book that had enormous influence on me, known probably to some of you, is... Um, Exit Voice Loyalty by Albert Hirschman, who's a great economist, still alive. Um, Hirschman says that in any group that you belong to, small or large, you owe it a certain amount of loyalty. But if things are not proper, you need to speak up. And you need to try to change things. And if that doesn't work, if you have any options at all, you should exit, you should leave. And um, this is not a place for me to be autobiographical, um, but I can say, having used that lens over the past decade or so to watch people and watch organizations, um, places where they don't have that mentality, they're just, you know, they're, they're, just, they're just places that are rotten to the core. And none of us gets it right, but that striving constantly to, um, when things aren't right, what do we do about it? At which point do we say, uh, I can't stay here anymore? And then, something which I still haven't sorted out in my own mind, when do we, do, when do we leave publicly and when do we leave privately? It's the Cyrus Vance question. Cyrus Vance resigned on principle during the um, Iran... When, hmm? Right, um, but he didn't speak publicly, and I don't know what's right, but uh, re you know, wrestling with these questions is very, very important. And of course, one of the important parts of religion as I know it is wrestling with these questions, not, knowing, not thinking there's a, a, a cut and dry answer. Okay, I think we have uh, two more questions, one and then that, and that'll have to be it. Thank you. I wondered if you would comment on the young people that are leading the uprising in the Middle East uh, through your lens of good citizen. Well, I'm sure your, inform your opinion is, is informed as mine. Um, I guess I would say that it was easy to be a member of a tribe until fairly recently. Um, you lived with a small group of people, maybe occasionally you see an ad or a movie, but 
now with Al Jazeera and tweet, Twitter and uh, uh, Facebook, uh, what used to be just in certain parts of the world or everywhere. Um, and especially with young people, aspirations are very important. And if you see possibilities elsewhere and you don't see them at home, um, uh, you know, you, you, you're mobilized in a way which would not have been possible before. Um, we could go through the whole history of the 20th century, and I'm sure the dean who studies these things could, could do chapter and verse. You know, if, if, uh, if Gaddafi decides to bomb everybody, you know, there'll be nothing left, but he'll still be, the, he'll still be Ozymandias. Um, but uh, that's less and less possible anymore. I didn't see it, but um, apparently Tom Friedman was interviewed by um, Anderson Cooper a night or two um, on, on TV. This was told to me by my wonderful uh, cab driver, George, this morning. And he said, American people are complaining because in 60 minutes of coverage, we have 50 minutes on the Middle East. When is that going to stop? And the cab driver said, Tom, Tom Friedman said, better get used to it. That's going to be the story of this century. So I don't see any way in which uh, uh, this is going to stop. I admire the aspirations. I admire the risk taking. Um, and it could not have happened without the social media. Uh, um, but uh, as, as, as Ethan Zuckerman, who studies this, points out, um, every technology can be used in a multitude of ways. And in Iran, when people Facebooked in 2009, they, they used it as a way of finding out that people were and arresting them. Uh, and, you know, probably Mubarak, if he wanted to stay in power, shouldn't have just shut off some of the internet. He should have shut the whole thing off. So it's very, very complicated. Uh, I'm so honored to be here. Uh, I'm, I'm not a student here. My husband is a graduate, graduate student here in Sanford. I'm from Brazil. And I don't know if you know that ethics is something that is not very well respected in Brazil, and I really don't like that. When I talk about ethics, I'm a teacher. I teach English in Brazil, in a, in a university in the Brazilian Amazon region. And people laugh, laugh at me. And even my family laughs at me when I tell, talk about ethics. And what is your suggestion for me when I come back, if I have to come back, to teach there, you know, where this society does not value ethics? Well, I, um, I thank you for uh, your, ni your nice comment about being honored to be here. Um, I, I don't feel that any of us is any different in that regard. And I appreciate your, your question very much. Um, I'm going to give you a, perhaps an answer you don't expect. First of all, I wouldn't use the word ethics. Um, I know when my kids went to secondary school, they did an ethics course and they made fun of it um, because it's, it has a kind of a, uh, should I say, moralistic tone to it. But anybody who ever goes to a movie with any kind of drama in it and argues about it is interested in ethical questions. I mentioned the question about the the child in the newspaper. I'll give you another example. Uh, there's a teacher who's very good. Let's call him Ed. He's a tremendous teacher, but he's a tough grader. And so the students love him, but he's a tough grader. So they go to him and say, you know, we think you're great, but other people are getting into graduate school because the other people are easier graders. We'd like you to grade easier so we'll get into graduate school. I've never seen a student who didn't find that an interesting kind of, kind of dilemma. So I would avoid the word and try to think more about issues and engaging them. I mean, when kids cheat, say, well, then why should we bother to go to school? Let's say everybody cheats. What's the point? And then you have to have a good answer why you should bother to go to school, and some people don't have good answers. But let me tell you something that will give you some hope. This is completely serendipitous. We're doing a huge study of how people um, uh, make judgments of quality, quality of life, quality of work, quality of objects. We did this study in the United States, but we just got 1,000 surveys from Brazil. And actually, I'm happy to be the first to tell you that at P2 
people in Brazil actually value ethics at the workplace more than people in the United States do. So if you send me an email, I can give you the statistics on it. So don't let the word impale you. Stick to, stick to the issues and uh, take some solace that this is a place where uh, at least your fellow countrymen value it more than, than, than ours do here. So that, that was not a set up question. But you want to take one more? Okay. Um, I'm interested in knowing how you and uh, you could measure your success when it comes to apply the, your ethical model into practice. So how could you distinguish people's individual, um, um, I'd say, selfish motivations from their good intentions? Um, first of all, I guess that even though I'm very interested in intentions, um, if I were the ethics czar, I would look at what people do rather than the reasons they give it. Sometimes I might learn that they meant well and just screwed up, and then their intention is important. But we're all terrific at rationalizing uh, Ill, you know, irresponsible or unethical behavior with very pious kinds of statements of intention. So I would really look at actions and behaviors. Um, I mean, some things are quite objective. I mean, you know, you can monitor how much cheating goes on in your class, and especially with uh, Turnitin and other kinds of uh, electronic ways, you can actually see who's plagiarizing. Um, other things are, um, they're, they're, they, they call for, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, people who are knowledgeable about the institution, inspectorate, that's it. Um, in, in England, for many, many years, um, schools are evaluated by people who are called inspectors, who are civil servants, who go around and spend a few days at the school, and they watch classes, they talk to people, and they come up with what I would say is a pretty good assessment of whether the school is doing a good job, whatever the criterion is. It could be completely curricular, it could be personal development, it could be ethical development. Um, I think that a similar kind of thing could be done in law firms, or it could be done in businesses. Um, so I, I guess my answer is there isn't going to be any one single measure, and certainly these things don't happen quickly, but I can certainly think of places which have been turned around in a positive way, in a negative way, including at my own university, where you know, there were things which were pretty admirable, which became unadm less admirable, and, and vice versa. And if I had to point to numbers, I might be able to, but sometimes it would just be a question of judgment. Thank you very much.